Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Roto World Football Show. I am Patrick Darty, joined by Denny Carter and Kyle Dvorak. It is Thursday, March 30th. Not a lot going on in the NFL, to be honest, this week, but there's still interesting storylines. We have interesting articles on the site. Kyle is ranking dynasty quarterbacks from this year's draft class. He did the same with tight ends. Denny has an article up on uh, the opposite of attractive dynasty quarterbacks, I would say. <laughs> quarterbacks he is claiming are underrated for 2023, including Kenny Pickett. So we'll see what Denny says. But I take no pleasure in that. And some news. The Lions uh, re-signing Marvin Jones. And if the Lions can possibly match last year's output. The Falcons at least claiming they're committing to Desmond Ritter. The Bengals be like, yeah, yeah, I heard of him about Joe Mixon and, <laughs> and not committing at all to him being on the roster. So a lot of interesting topics today, but it's been well established that you guys aren't really the biggest baseball grinders. Uh, but we know that you are DFS grinders. It's opening day. And you said you might run some stacks by me as someone who actually does follow the beautiful game of Major League Baseball. We need we need your help, Pat. No, to, <laughs> please. To, uh, I'm here. Um, I'm here to lose you money instantly. All right. So my question is this. Okay. First of all, I'm playing in large field uh, DFS tournaments. So this one does. When you go against a guy named DeGrom, do you start all the hitters against that guy? I mean, I might take some flack for saying this, but you do because he's going to leave after 3.2 innings with forearm tightness. Okay. Um, uh, well, might be too soon to make that that's, joke. But, that's the process then. Um, that is the process. Yeah. Uh, yeah. DeGrama, when he is healthy, a little hard on the hitters, wouldn't typically be who I would stack against, Craig. Okay. And then my other question was, how many Marlins do we use against the Mets? <laughs> so, as, as Denny, if you're not watching, which you're probably listening uh, celebrating the 2003 Marlins World Series Championship with a customized Carter Marlins jersey. It's uh, it's it's tw- the 20 year anniversary. No one's talking about this. No, of the not. Marlins beating the Yankees. Do you know how big of an upset that was? That was that was after the the Diamondbacks beat the Yankees two years prior, right? Or oh, one the, year prior. It was the end of no, it was two years prior. It was the end of a dynasty. Josh Beckett pitched on two days rest in Game Six of the two two thousand three World Series. Threw, I believe, a two hit shutout. A hero for Yankees haters. For yeah, that time. he was. I celebrated the entire catalog in St. Louis, Missouri. I mean, you can't get too many. the The, the Marlins have decided that Luis Arias is their franchise player, a uh, slap hitter who lucked into a batting title last year. Got to get him in there. <laughs> Uh, John Birdie, who actually might steal a few bases now that they've made the bases. Uh, Kyle's used this word before. The bases have become very large this year. Um, they're very, very large. Um, Gene Segura might take advantage of the large bases. I believe Jazz Chisholm is hurt. He would be too. You're making up names at this point. You're yeah, definitely making up real. names. What are you Avisel talking? Garcia looking to bounce back from a down 2022. You just you just jam Marlins in there. Uh, okay. Option. Yeah. I'll do it. I'll do um, it. Who, let me see who they're facing. I'm assuming they're facing someone amazing. Oh, they are facing Max Scherzer and the New York Mets. Right. Um, I know that name, so that's probably bad. If I know oh, a pitcher's he, name. It is bad. He has that, he has that dog, right? He's a, he's a big dog guy. Who? Scherzer? Uh, oh, yeah. Scherzer right. is. Uncontainable levels of dog. This is how we do it in St. Louis Mo, where he's from. Right, I, I think I think every he every playoffs I, I see him and all the announcers can talk about is this the level of dog that he the has. dog levels and the favorite fact that he has two different colored eyes he has one That's brown eye thought, and one yeah. blue eye it's a it's a Bowie situation I, it's I very know. very That's... freaky for the batters um, very very freaky for fantasy managers guys is the Falcons trying to say they're committing to Desmond Ritter as their starting quarterback for 2023 I know some people out there in the fantasy verse. We're actually into this idea. I didn't love Desmond Ritter as a prospect. Didn't love what I saw. Very small sample size as a rookie. I just think hmm, he looks very robotic to me. Like he, he he almost looks like too fundamental. Like he can't. Like he is like he's like AI's version of how a quarterback is supposed to operate. <laughs> and I mean, do we really believe that they're going to commit to Desmond Ritter? Um, like I mean, I guess they don't have much better options. They could trade up to number three with the Cardinals, I suppose, Kyle. I mean, what the heck do we, is, is this in like trying to like get the fan base ready for like, yeah, sorry, we're not upgrading the Ritter guy. Yeah. I like, I could see that. Yeah. Cause I don't really think like, like one, two quarterback is locked in. Panthers aren't trading down despite what we got. Those like brief reports of one, two are locked in at quarterback. And I think there's a tear break after that, especially for guys who are like easy to project as day one starters. Like I think Richardson has, I mean, he literally does have all the athleticism in the world. He's the 
most athletic quarterback we've ever seen. Will Levis is not quite that level of athlete, but he's still a really strong athlete. But they're he's very also 36 years old. Um, yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> like, I think it could be 24 by the time the season starts, if I remember correctly. Yeah, just, so I don't think they're upgrading. Bit. Because you'd be you'd be trading up for the third best quarterback, and the third best is a tier gap going down from two to three. I mean, they're posturing as if, yeah, probably bad for one more year, but go in strong next year with a shot at the 101, 102. And that's mm-hmm. really where you want to be like taking your quarterback if you're a franchise. So yeah, I kind of think they are doing exactly that. They are sort of signaling that. One more year, guys, then you can start to get your hopes up. Uh, of course, then the rookie has to acclimate. Then you probably have to get a second coach in, you know, his third yeah, offensive coordinator in yeah. four years. That guy's fired. But I, I think they're stuck kind of. I think a lot of the teams that don't pick top four or are not willing to really move up because Arizona is a spot, right, that are not really willing to pay up to get there. They're just kind of stuck losing for a year. And uh, I think they're actually sort of posturing well to do that. Same with the, the Bucks, right? Like, I don't think they're going to win a lot of games with Baker or Kyle Trask or whatever, but like they're positioning well to get a good pick next year. And you should be trying to shoot for pick 32 or pick one. So it's probably yeah. another bad year for the Falcons, but that's, that's part, it, that's part of, you know, in, in the words of Danny Carter, that's part of the process. That is the process. Uh, Desmond Ritter was atrocious last year and it wasn't that small a sample. I would argue uh, uh, four starts, 115 pass attempts, uh, guys, uh, he threw two touchdowns on 115 pass attempts. That's good for a 1.6% touchdown rate. Uh, no interceptions, which is good. Uh, one thing that's not good is a 6.5 uh, yard uh, adjusted yards per attempt. Uh, so um, all that tells me that we are talking about a guy who cannot keep the starting job if he actually goes into the season as a starter. And Arthur Smith is trying his best. I I, I feel for Arthur Smith in a way. <laughs> Um, but he's trying his best to sell Desmond Ritter as the answer or possibly the answer. And I, 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 I could tell you that he's, he's not, he's not going to, be. he's not. And, but it's weird though. I don't, Kyle, I don't think they're planning to be bad this year. I don't think they realize they're going to be bad. They actually took a pretty big step forward last year from 2021. I mean, they had one of the worst point differentials in the league in 2021. They were much more neutral last year. Had one of the leagues, I think only one of five teams to produce positive rushing EPA. So they at least did get the run game down. I I just don't understand why they weren't a little more aggressive at backup quarterback. Where I, I feel like even Gardner Minshew would have been a colossal yes. upgrade on uh, Taylor Heineke. And I, I think I think they actually do kind of believe in Desmond Ritter, which I, I think is a poor uh, idea. It, um, you you put know. listen, you put Gardner Minshew on, on the Falcons, and they win that division. That, that 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 would be my no, we, my argument. We reacted and with stunned silence. I what he's he is vastly better than Taylor Heineke and Desmond Ritter. Yes, yes, yes. I mean Taylor Heineke, man. I mean, just why? Like, why would why are you doing this? I mean, right. I know we were talking about dog levels. I mean, everyone knows uh, no one has more dog than him. So but. we we talked about this. Uh, Heineke had a, a really good game against the Falcons two years ago, and they haven't forgotten that. And you know that that that's that's what happens with these teams is you you see a player perform once live and you go well we got to have him next time he's available it's quite quite the thing and I and I really think there's something to it anyway yeah no Ritter is not going to keep this job there are, there's no measurement that you can point to and say oh well there is there is some hope for him uh, there's I mean and, and he dropped where he did RIPing his career a little early I mean I basically I did too. But I, mean, I feel like you just like real deal RIP in his career. For the I, I mean, he, he could be a, a, like an okay backup, you know, going forward. <laughs> Maybe, probably not. That that's a career right there. That's <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is a career. Dude, I mean, guys look, get paid millions to do nothing. He could be among them. I do think. Sorry, I do think. So it seems like they would have to trade up to number three. It could be one of those years though, where like there's a lot of talk about a trade up, but it turns out no one is like actually head over heels with Anthony Richardson or Will Levis. The Falcons. I think Will Levis would be the one. I actually do think there is a possibility I do too. that uh, that Levis just kind of tumbles, uh, you know, back maybe even into the teens. But like, there would be and a the reason Falcons, for that. It's a guy who's comfortable with the Tannehill system, the Titans system. I think he would think like, I can make Will Levis a thing, <laughs> and I could see it happening. You might think that. Falcons. Yeah, I mean, you think a lot of yeah. things. I I will say, uh, if the Falcons go for Will Levis, they will throw 
they would like set a modern record for fewest pass attempts this year. Like it'll make Kyle Pitts undraftable at ADP. It'll make Drake Lennon undraftable. Like this is a this, talk about rest RIP rest in peace. The entire Falcons offense for fantasy. Then you're acting like Kyle Pitts has ever been draftable. <laughs> Well, yeah, we'll I, lose all that production we got from him last year that we were just soon. windmill. Yeah, yeah. look, I, I it's March, so I don't <laughs> you know. I, I don't want to get too carried away, but there's almost no scenario in which I will draft Kyle Pitts uh, in any format this year. Yeah, probably not. And this leads me to an interesting topic. I feel like on the Lions, who were, were fantasy darlings last year, heading into the season, they were kind of like analytics darlings heading into the season last year. They then delivered on it. They finished eight and two down the stretch. I believe they scored the fifth most overall points, which to do that with Jared Goff, who was like a mercy throw in to the Matthew Stafford trade is stunning. And I just also kind of think unrepeatable. And yeah, but they've brought the whole band back together after they re-signed Marvin Jones. And we know the hype's going to be just out of control. How do you guys think though, where it might end up being profitable to fade the lions in fantasy where, I mean, last year just honestly looks like an outlier to me with Jared Goff running an offense. And I, I don't know if you can ever be top five in points again with Jared Goff. I think maybe they could do it. Like they've got, they've got a really good team outside of Jared Goff. I don't think they'll be top five again. Right. But would it shock me if they did? Like they had really, really highly touted prospect, Jameson Williams. What do you think he ran? Like 50 routes? Like I didn't pull it up. It was like 50 routes late into the oh, season. Wow. Like <laughs> they will, they're getting an extra first round pick essentially because they didn't really get to use him last year. Their offensive line is really strong. Like they have not only James Williams, but they already have one of the like best ascending receivers in Amon Ross St. Brown, a really strong running back in DeAndre Swift. They have talent, right? And Jared Goff actually excels a lot when he has talent around him. Now I agree. There are reasons that I would bet against them being a top five offense again. They were fourth in touchdowns per drive. They were second in yard or in 40 plus yardage runs and fifth in 40 plus yardage passes, just raw volume of those. Like those things are going to be hard to repeat. And especially like the long passes, like that's almost the opposite of Jared Goff, right? He's a guy who you kind of expect to routinely churn out eight or so yards. I don't expect him to consistently get really long passing plays. So, yeah, I, I don't think they're going to be an elite offense again, but maybe they open it up more, pass a little more now that they have even better receiving weapons. I mean, I think there are avenues for them to fade the regression, even if it is like probably less efficiency. Maybe they pass more. Maybe they play with more pace. But so, yeah, top five. They're not doing it. The, <laughs> yeah. uh, Jared Goff's 2022 numbers are not vastly different from his career marks. Um that includes some good years, obviously, with the Rams. Uh, the one thing that jumps out here is that his adjusted yards per attempt jumped from 6.6 .6 in 2021 to 8 in 2022. That's the second highest mark of his career, that, that 8 adjusted yards per attempt. So there was there was more aggressive throwing. There was there were fewer uh, checkdowns. And so I, I'm not uh, totally on board with saying the Lions are, are going to disappoint or or regress in any in any major way. I also like that Dan Campbell is aggressive. He's a very aggressive yeah, I mean, play, play caller. Dan Campbell is amazing. And they do maintain the personalities from the field stretchers and Marvin Jones and Jamison Williams, hopefully healthy. I mean, their underneath guy, Amon Ra, is one of the more explosive underneath guys in the entire right. league. DeAndre Swift, you know, uh, that'll happen, right? Yeah, um, sure. Look, for the dozen who could forget Demont Nation, game? by the way, who could forget? Uh, most he, of us could forget Demont Nation. He, but was he with the Lions? I can't remember, he, actually. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's going to be on every one of my teams. Are you kidding right, me? Good, good. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It just seems like that touchdown rate is probably going to come down a little bit. And probably the yeah. attempt. But I don't know. It could be like a generational type coach. I can't believe I just said that. Yeah, I mean, look, his touchdown rate was 4.9 last year. That's that's a little above his, his career rate of 4.4. Um, I, I, I don't. I'm not saying that golf is like like fa like found something that makes him elite. Okay, like he's he's, he's found a not. good team. That's what he's found. He's found right. a really good offensive line in front of him, a really good core of pass yeah. catchers, and good running backs too. I, I think you know they're stubbing out part you know the, the early down part of their backfield. But DeAndre Swift, whenever you can, whenever you can throw to DeAndre Swift and get him to break long runs for you, like that's also extremely elite. So that's what he's found. He, he's 
probably the same. I mean, he is for sure the same guy that he was both in the down years with McVay, but also in the good years. So uh, yeah, top five. No, but I agree. Like he wasn't, he didn't like have some crazy outlier performance last year. The outliers were just some long plays and some general good turnover luck. Probably maybe they regress from that, but like, it's a good team. I kind of agree with Denny that like they're, I, I don't see them bottoming out by any means. Didn't any parting thoughts there? Uh, no, I'm, uh, I'm on the, I'm on the Dan Campbell bandwagon. We have our <laughs> analytics King and he has muscles and we appreciate it. I will say by the way, David Montgomery has never played in an offense anywhere even close to this good. And even though he's a meme, I mean, a good front office, a good offense did identify him as a replacement for Jamal Williams, be the best offense and offensive line of his career. And then maybe it's time for Demon Nation to actually be a thing. I yeah, listen, I'm on I'm finally, finally on board with this Demon thing. Yes. Yeah, there we go. Demon All Nation. Pass, but I hope you guys have fun with it. You know who is not on board with a running back is the Cincinnati Bengals with their starting running back, Joe Mixon, yeah. or their yeah. Barely acknowledging his existence. They're doing the classic. Yeah, I heard of him. Uh, yeah, I was flipping through our, you know, what do you call that? The, the Sunday. What do you call the Sunday thing? They sell at the stadiums. Oh. So, the program? No. program yeah, the yeah. program. Yeah, yeah, the program. Probably a guy in there. He's on our team. Uh, yeah, what about well, that, That's what the, the executive vice president, uh, Katie Blackburn for the Bengals, said, said this uh, when asked about will Joe Mixon be the starting running back in 2023? She, she said, quote, right now, He's on the team, uh, and we are going to count on him until that wouldn't be the case. But yeah, he's the guy. I think he's still got a lot of production left in him. So I, that that to me, and also if you hear the audio, it's tortured. It is. There's a about nine too many qualifying <laughs> statements in there. Dan. Yeah, it's a tortured answer that tells me that the team has no intention of having Joe Mixon on their week one. Roster. There's also this, if I could just mention this real quick from the NFL owners meetings uh, this week, Zach Taylor um, said uh, signing a running back in free agency is a quote possibility. I don't even know who would be left at this point, but added, he really likes the progress of running back Travion Williams, who he re-signed Ooh. this month. Quote, we, we have high him. hopes for him. Uh, he understands what it takes to compete in this league. There's also Chris Evans, uh, Kyle, before the show, made the point. I I say that uh, it, it, he has no business making this point, but uh, I should just mention on, the, on air that uh, Travion Williams was a, a healthy scratch throughout the season. <laughs> so we'll have to. He's been a dynasty him. darling for approximately the length of two rookie contracts, where he's never was appeared in the game. But <laughs> wasn't he wasn't he a uh, and M guy? Is that correct? Sounds about uh, right. Probably when Ryan Tannehill like a, was the quarterback like twelve years ago. I feel like he was like a two thousand yard rusher one year at A and M, like a late career breakout at A and M, if I remember correctly. But yeah, I looked it up. He was a healthy scratch for like basically the first half of the season. He eventually, uh, he eventually did get in as a special teamer. I think he's like a kick returner or something. So like, I'm not putting much stock in that. I'm sure he has improved because he was not a part of the team's plans on Sundays for about half the season. An improvement would be being a part of those plans. And he was. So yeah. that's an improvement. I just don't get why at this point they would cut Joe Mixon. They've, the free agency is dead already, right? There's there's yeah. almost nothing left. They have enough cap space to sign their rookies and they have not added a backup veteran yet, like a veteran they could possibly platoon with a rookie. And they, they can't count on taking a first round running back. Bijan might not be there by then. So like I, I don't get why at this point, uh, like why now they probably they might be waiting for the draft just to see if they get someone they like, and then apparently if he's a post June first cut, well you can make him a post June first cut now. Yeah, but they could they haven't Say designated ten million post June yet. Yeah, so they could already he could have been one of them. Clears a lot of money for next year, um, and they might just be waiting honestly for the draft. And it's, since it's not urgent to cut him, maybe they'll just cut him if they get someone they like to pair with. Uh, yeah, it's still possible. I would put the odds pretty slim, though. I feel like it, it's like less than like a one in five. I feel like it's between. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you like the tenor of the comments really do matter. They don't. I agree. They, they know what they're doing. They they're like, oh yeah, we love Joe Mixon's led this rushing attack for six years. We we know he's going to do a great job in twenty twenty three. I think he's gone. Like you don't really ever they, talk like that. You're yeah, they had a similar something. sentiment at the combine too, because there was like the back-to-back questions of like, "Are you going to consider trading T. Higgins?" And they're like, "No way. We won't. We wouldn't trade T. T's a boss. We're not going to do that." And they're like, "What about Joe Mixon? Could you cut him?" And they're like, "Never heard of him." Like I, yeah, maybe yeah. it was the same thing. Yeah, it's just like the timing of it doesn't make a ton of sense. But I agree that like they could just be waiting to see. Um, 
like what what kind of full unfolds in the draft they also were potentially awaiting some and it doesn't look like this will end up manifesting but they were like potentially waiting some legal stuff to come out for joe mix and uh nothing ever manifested from it but that was also a reason they could have been holding off on making any move with him so it's still possible i think uh, it's it's funny. Yeah, curious that you guys are dismissing Travion Williams, a guy oh who on 47 career rushing attempts ha- is averaging 5.2 yards per carry. I, I'm just saying, you know, it's it's Perhaps. just funny. You guys claim to like good players, and yet you're saying Travion Williams, no good. Just the facts. And if Joe Mixon ends up elsewhere, he's not going to find a better fit than the Bengals. Like, And he's been so yeah. inefficient for one of the league's best offenses the past two years. He did score 13 touchdowns in 2021, but that efficiency just never materialized for him. And, you know, he's just like an average pass catcher too, even though he was supposed to be like a three down dynamo and his, his best days will be behind him. If he is cut by the Cincinnati yeah. Bengals. We're just, we're just going to put him straight on the Dallas roster. Well, yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, that is, we've already done that in our CMS. Here at NBC Sports <laughs> Edge. And the, you know, whose best days are not behind them is this podcast. We'll, we'll, we will be right back after this. New MLB season, new rules, new stars. So pair it with the Roto World Baseball Draft Guide. Get all the player profiles, rankings, and projections you need to hit your draft out of the park. Go to NBCSportsEdge.com slash draft guide and use promo code PENNANT25 to save 25% at checkout. That's promo code PENNANT25 to save 25% at checkout. And of course, do not forget to download the Roto World app to receive breaking player news all season long. Stay ahead of the competition by favoriting players on your roster. Get the latest injury updates, player news, and much more delivered right to your phone. It is available in your app store today. So we said there wasn't a whole lot of news this week. That's why we got Denny talking about a bunch of 35-year-old quarterbacks that are probably <laughs> bounce back in uh, 2023, Denny. That is wild. Uh, explain your article to us, and then we'll start uh, with the first quarterback you want to talk about that supposedly will be better next year. Yeah. So look, I, I I basically I just wanted to identify quarterbacks who had major major drops in touchdown rate, and in some cases adjusted yards per attempt. Okay, so the guys who just had abysmal seasons uh, that are uh, way out of whack when you look at their career numbers. Okay, so that that's that was the starting point, and I came up with these four gems. Okay, four of the, you know, many are calling them the most elite quarterbacks in the league. <laughs> we'll start with Kenny Pickett. Um, <laughs> and look, look I, for me, I actually, uh, just from, from my perspective, the way I see Kenny Pickett, I think that he's the starter for the Steelers because he played college ball in Pittsburgh. That's, that's a fact. fact. Certified fact. I, I, the, and and so that's the otherwise he's playing in the USFL coming up. Um, Come on, man. And, and uh, no, I mean he's he's legit. He's not good. He's, he's playing for good. Josh McDaniels, his second round pick. If the if they hadn't taken him in the first, the Steelers. So you you <laughs> you remember you may remember Kenny Pickett from his rookie season when he threw a whopping seven touchdowns in. Let me check. Yes, twelve starts, seven in twelve. Folks. Does seem unsustainably low. <laughs> yeah, and that's what we're getting at. So Pickett's uh, one point eight percent touchdown rate ranked. 33rd dead last among qualifying quarterbacks in this little exercise of mine. If you, ha- if, if Pickett had middle of the road touchdown rate, like four and a half percent around there, he would have had 18 touchdowns last year, guys, in his 12 starts. I mean, it's not the greatest thing ever, but it's a hell of a lot more than seven per the analytics. So um, uh, he was also last among the 33 qualifying quarterbacks with a 5.5 adjusted yards per attempt. Sounds great. I, I <laughs> Here, and and you know maybe most concerningly is that his efficiency actually not sp- I don't want to say spiked increased when the Steelers went super crazy run heavy at the end of the season. Um, so I, I think we're what we see is a game manager who could have a little bit of a of a touchdown bounce bounce back. So he's not relevant in one quarterback leagues unless you're like streaming like a de- desperation streamer type. But super flex leagues, he might be a little better than you think looking at those seven touchdowns from last year. I will just say, I mean, part of it, I'm sure you would think in your head like the supporting cast, but the Steelers supporting cast isn't quite as good as we're used to seeing. It's still Deontay Johnson. It's still George Pickens after a pretty uneven rookie year. Pat Fryermuth has had some concussion issues. So there are some weapons there. 
but it's not quite as loaded as we're used to from the Steelers uh, supporting cast. I'll say it could be a problem for Mr. Kenny Pickett as a sophomore. It, it definitely could. Kyle, how do you feel about Kenny Pickett? He's fine. I feel like he gets a little too much hate because uh, like he, he kind of ruined this offense and Mitchell Trubisky looked better than him. Those are reasons to dislike him. But he was a rookie. We have less than a 400 attempt sample on him. He had a really strong, it was his fifth year, but he did have a really strong final collegiate season. And he did some stuff well as a rookie. He was 12th in completion percent over expected, mostly buoyed by having a pretty nice deep ball. He was sixth in PFF passing grade on deep throws, 15th in adjusted completion percentage. And it wasn't like he was just chucking it up there. He actually had a pretty low turnover worthy play rate, too. Like he was picking his shots and shooting them well. So, that's something to hang your hat on. He needs to be much more consistent on just short to intermediate throws, Mm -hmm. but maybe he can develop it. Right. I I don't think like, I saw a lot of people saying Pittsburgh needed to ditch him and go rookie quarterback this year. Like, what are they going to do trade up, you know, 13 picks just to get the third best prospect (laughs) for a court, like to replace a quarterback who has like, then he said he didn't play the full season. He didn't, he didn't play the summer out as if he was going to be the starter week one either. So he doesn't have, a full off season of first team reps under his belt yet. Like I'd give him another chance. I don't, I'm not super optimistic about how that chance goes, but I think there's at least some reason to believe he'll be, I mean, he has to be better. He, he literally can't throw fewer touchdowns I mean, on a per throw base. You don't always have to be better. It doesn't always happen that way. He, he can't throw. I will. I would bet anything. He doesn't throw a, at a lower touchdown rate. As then he said, dead last. It's yeah, hard to be. I, that is unsustainable. Whatever. Though. Yeah, yeah. I know Daniel Jones like sustained better. that for like three years, though. And that's that's a great thank you for transitioning to Daniel Jones because <laughs> yeah, I, I had I had the hardest time uh, making the case for Daniel Jones to to bounce back from a very low touchdown rate, three point two percent in twenty twenty two. He ranked twenty eighth out of the thirty three qualifying QBs. Uh, I said as I wrote in the article, which you can find on NBCSportsEdge.com shortly after this podcast is posted. Uh, somewhat concerningly, that's not far off from his career touchdown rate of 3.4%. Um, I'm going to hit you with a stat here, and, uh, and I desperately want your reactions in, in real time. Uh, Daniel Jones has 27 touchdown passes over his past 26 games. What do we think of that? Doesn't sound like a lot. Um, I guess, honestly, I was thinking, I thought you were going to say career at first. I'm like, yeah, scans. Um, no, 26 and, games, 27 times. Uh, it sounds maybe a little high because he, he, oh, wow. he, he had several years where he threw fewer than one per game. I think his first two years, maybe his first three years, he threw fewer than one per game. Um, it's has made a ton of right progress. Right. He was playing for Joe Judge two of those years. So, yeah. but, but last year it didn't change. That's the thing. That's the thing. So Brian Dable spent all last se- all, la- all last off season saying, "Please, Daniel Jones, sometimes throw it downfield." And Daniel Jones said, "I ain't reading all that," and he <laughs> did not do it. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't do it. Like his adjusted yards per attempt were pretty similar to what they have been. He refused to. Th- he refuses to throw downfield now for fantasy. It should be okay because Daniel Jones gives you the rushing, whatever. But man, he picked a good time to have one good game. Uh, against the uh, Vikings in the playoffs. Because... I thought you were saying this was the players who were underrated for 2023. Uh, well, the, I, like I said, Daniel Jones, out of these four quarterbacks, he's the one who you, you have to squint real hard to see regression because he just hasn't been a good passer. He hasn't been a good passer. There's more money uh, I stand is what you're saying. Yeah, I can tee up uh, the pro Daniel Jones argument okay. Okay. Uh, in that – if you look closely at the depth chart last year, Isaiah Hodgins was his top receiver. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure they picked up Isaiah Hodgins after the Bills cut him in like week four. Uh, so maybe don't do that. Maybe maybe Brian Dable, instead of saying, hey, Daniel Jones, I know part of why you don't throw deep is because you don't have anyone to throw deep to. Do right. it anyways. Maybe don't do that and add a receiver. Or don't trade away Kadarius Tony, though they clearly like didn't want to use him anyways and he had a rip with the team. So... We'll ignore that and say that's fine, but add a receiver for him. They've already added Darren Waller, who's like kind of a receiver. At least he is at least as much of a target earner as a receiver. Last year, he actually moved the ball a little bit more downfield, or he was a deeper ADOT player last year. So there's some hope for him, but I do think a lot of why he doesn't throw deep, it's endemic to who he is. So yeah, and 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 also he makes some of it up as a runner, uh, you know, rushing in some some touchdowns. But I, I kind of agree that of these guys, like Kenny Pickett is so low, it's unsustainable. 
uh, and you showed some reasons for hope. You'll talk about a few other guys later who I think other reasons could buoy their touchdown rate from last year. I agree. This is one where like, I think it's reasonable to project Daniel Jones to be a considerably below average touchdown rate thrower. He does other things well, but that's probably never going to be his MO. So a part of the squinting exercise that I, I mentioned is seeing that the Giants were ninth in the league in EPA per play last year. And, th- and this is, like you said, with a with a wide receiver group among the worst in the league without in the history you know, of the league <laughs> that, you know, possibly uh, we, we do need to look into that. But the and, and without Brian Dable's guys, you know, really like he's still building his team. So with a, with an offense that that finished that uh, efficiently last year. Um, you would think Daniel Jones could kind of stumble into some touchdowns. So that, that would be my argument for him. Uh, on, to, on to Denver, folks, where we have Russell Wilson. Oh, oh, I, I, I told you this is not, you know, these, these are these are not the greatest. But no, players. this case is easy to make, and someone needs to make it, and that person is you. It is. Listen, it, and this is, a, this is a slam dunk, in my opinion. Uh, is, uh, t- as long as he beats out Jarrett Stidham for the starting job. Of which, I mean – the way that Sean Payton talks about Jared Stidham, I mean, no one has talked about a quarterback like that since uh, Bill Walsh talked about Joe Montana. Okay? <laughs> it's, it is alarming. It's wow. They, I mean, coaches love Jared Stidham. Anyway, Russell Wilson, uh, touchdown rate fell last year to a career low 3.3%. Whew. That's about 2.7% below his career touchdown rate. Um, Wilson registered a career low in adjusted yards per attempt last year way below his adjusted yards per attempt on his career of 8.2. It was less than seven last year. I mean, his, his drop off, I go into the article, his drop off was extraordinary in, in every measurement. I tend to think that at 34 years old, a guy who hasn't suffered a serious injury, I know he just underwent a, a knee surgery. So I, I do get that, but a guy, a guy who hasn't suffered a to undergo knee surgery at the age of 34, like a major injury who takes care of himself to an obsessive degree. I, I tend to think that age can't explain some huge drop off at 34 years old. And I think, you know, Sean Payton coming in telling everybody I'm, I'm the captain. We're going to do things my way, actually implementing an offense rather than Russell Wilson calling audibles that he called in Seattle, uh, you know, in, in, in the Denver huddle. So, you know, I, I, I do think that we can expect, him Russell Wilson to get back to those career marks. Now I'm not saying, you know, you, you draft him highly or anything, but he could be useful in that way. He was someone who before his recent regression, the past two years, I mean, had reached kind of rarefied efficiency air. Like he was one of the more efficient players in the entire league. And he was one kind of like Aaron Rodgers. Like he produced like top five or six fantasy QB seasons, even when he wasn't throwing for like 4,000 yards necessarily. Yeah. And as we know, Sean Payton, one of the most efficient play callers in modern NFL history should be a great fit, at least in theory where he can be pretty, he's been weirdly inaccurate on like shorter throws lately, but he can be pretty accurate on the intermediate stuff. And unlike Drew Brees, the final few years of his career, he can kind of maybe restore that deep element, Sean Payton's offense. So it all makes sense unless Russ is just actually done, which there is a non zero percent chance he's done. From from a from a from 2014 to 2021, no one, no quarterback had a higher uh, completion rate over expected than Russell Wilson. I, you know, he like I just I have a hard time accepting that he just forgot how to play the position last year. He might have, Kyle. Any Russ thoughts? Yeah, he was he was so good. Like he was model breaking good. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. in in the famous Pete Carroll offense, right? Because they had multiple offensive coordinators while he was there. And I think a lot of it was Nathaniel Hackett last year. Like there was like dumb stuff. Like the amount of penalties they took is almost like clear evidence. It was a coaching issue, right? And some of that could also fall on the quarterback. Uh, But I do think having a coach who knows what he's doing will actually be a pretty big uh, boon for this offense. And like then he said, it, it wasn't like his arm appeared to give out. It wasn't like, you know, the final Manning season or whatever, right? Where he's just lobbing up ducks it just looked like complete chaos on the field. Like he had no clue what was going on. His receivers weren't on the same page as him. We have so many mm, chef's kiss clips of his receivers screaming at him on the yeah. field. So not even good receivers I, either. Like it was I, like number I know. five receivers screaming at him. I know. I wasn't one. Of, didn't KJ Hamler do that one? Yeah. Got hurt? yeah KJ Hamler. <laughs> KJ Hamler so, is now hurt again. Yeah. Well, uh, 
Yeah, what can you do? But uh, yeah, this to me it looked like very much uh like managerial problems as much as that can happen for a football team. Now, like does Kyle, return- it was kind of like a perfect storm too, where like Russ and his ego last year didn't seem like the kind of quarterback you want to be having managerial issues with. Mm-hmm. So just like a, a really, really toxic brew when you combine it all together. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I this one, like I can see it. And I I mean I want to see it. I was in on Russ last year, but like Danny said, this wasn't an age guys falling off thing. And because of that, going from an iconically bad offense, an entire offensive system, but specifically a head coach who didn't know what he was doing to one of the most successful head coaches in NFL history. Like even, even if, uh, even if Peyton comes in and is kind of phoning in and just wait and take the off season off to go fishing, that will still be an upgrade. (laughs) Kudos to the Broncos for having a fortitude to be one and done, by the way, like it just, it had to be done. And you can understand why you don't want to go one and done, but it had to be done. Then if you don't have anything else to say on Russell Wilson, which I think you might, you can say it. But uh, I don't actually. I don't know uh, if the next one's an illicit groans or what. Well, he, he this is a guy who will probably play in the NFL this year. <laughs> yes. and that is true. Uh, his name is Matthew Stafford. He missed half of last season, very various ailments, including a concussion that's lingered for a long time. He has an elbow issue that is uh, more like, from what I understand, a pitcher's issue is. uh like from, overuse from overuse and uh, past three or four years he's been on the injury report with seriously like nine different bodies. yeah parts. all the all the sidearm stuff matthew you gotta cut it cut it out uh let's just go straight over the top on every throw please and uh, you know he says he's coming back sean sean mcfay says of course he's coming back so i His guess wife said lol on her podcast he's coming back of course right. um i so, said lol because you've persecuted me for saying lol in the past <laughs> <laughs> so we knew going into 2022, we knew that Stafford was was not going to reach the marks that he had in 2021 simply because he had a 6.8% touchdown rate in 2021 among the highest in the league uh, that year. But what we didn't anticipate was that that touchdown rate falling all the way off to 3.3%. Um, seventh worst among the 33 quarterbacks I looked at. And the yeah. second worst mark, the second lowest mark of Matthew Stafford's 14 year NFL it career. Hasn't been that long. Uh, I, Pat, listen, the, the fact that he's been playing for 14 years makes me feel. Like earlier, it. you claimed 2003 was 20 years ago. <laughs> and I can't prove it, but I, it feels like it. I would say. It does feel like it. Heavy uh, and, and And so the argument here would be that Stafford obviously likely does not get back to anything close to that 6.8% touchdown rate, but 3.3 is catastrophically low. He gets Cooper cut back. Uh, hopefully the Rams are, you know, make adjustments to the offensive line, which wasn't, wasn't so hot last year. Um, protect no. Stafford uh, a, a little more. And also there's this, there's this, if I could just say real quick, Sean McVay loves throwing inside the 10 yard line. So in that great 2021 season, uh, Stafford led all quarterbacks in attempts inside the 10 yard line at 26 of his 41 touchdown passes came on those throws. Yeah. Inside the 10. So if we could get back to that sort of Rams offense, which I guess is a somewhat of a long shot, Stafford could become somewhat interesting. I guess. Poor Kyle jumps in. I will say Stafford, you know, in Detroit, there were lots of years where he was like famously inefficient despite having like oh. Calvin Johnson, yeah. where, you know, he would get the close to like 5,000 yards. We would have like 28 touchdowns and they were, he was like a Lucy with the football and fantasy for like a really, really long time. Like this is finally the year the Matthew Stafford can't screw this up. And he somehow like always screwed it up. I agree. It's hard to envision that being like you said, the, the fall off from 6.8 to 3.3 is just like catastrophic. And I mean, famous last words, things cannot go worse for the Rams this year than they did last year. <laughs> um, they're going to have like blockers and actual like pass catchers. But I, Kyle, what do you think? I mean, he's a guy who's going to be 35 and has seriously injured almost every part of his body in the past half decade. Yeah, I, I think this one is probably more likely to be than Russ one where like, dude, I don't know, maybe Matthew Stafford's just cooked because even like you said, like his touchdown rate fell, his EPA per play was dreadful in the first 10 weeks. He was 39th among quarterbacks with at least 100 uh, 100 plays. He was a negative CPOE guy. And like, 
how are they going to get better? They have one top 50 pick, a few third round picks. The offensive line can use work. It's not as bad. It shouldn't at least be as bad as it was last year, because I want to say up until maybe the final few weeks of the season, final two or three weeks, they started like a new combination every single week. They could not stay healthy. But when healthy, this line doesn't look like it's anything special. It's a long shot from what they had during that Super Bowl run. The receivers, you know, you dress the line, right? You spend multiple day two picks on it, right? Receivers outside of Cooper Cup are nothing. Like, they just don't have anything to work with there. Yeah. And that's a problem when your entire offense can be boiled down to one pass catcher. So it should be better, but I'm not incredibly optimistic on this upcoming season for the offense. And the Rams, you know, they've got so many holes. Uh, they do not have a pick in the first 35 picks. They have one pick in the first 69, three in the first 77. Ooh, going quite a ways down. Yeah, they still have very, very little draft pick ammunition this year. Yeah. And they have no picks. How is this possible? They have no picks between 77 and 167. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> Yikes. Might need to get a few more draft picks. Yes. Yeah. I'm not sure how they're going to fix all these issues. I actually uh, saw an interview with Sean McVay where he was really excited to finally make a pick before the third round, which is, <laughs> which is something that the Rams haven't done recently. Well, do you guys know the trivia. Who was the most recent Rams first round pick? Was it was it golf? It golf. It was golf. Yeah. Wow. They have not made a first round pick since Jared Goff. That is. I wonder who the most recent first round pick that's on their roster is. Because like it won't be Goff. It won't be Gurley. Aaron Donald probably in St. Louis. Um, he's one wow. of. The, oh my god. <laughs> in St. Louis, my yeah. god. <laughs> he's one of the few remaining St. Louis Rams. Rest in peace. Uh, they were stolen from us. Um, and Stan Kroenke. You just don't do that to your home state. You just don't do You're named after Stan Musial and Ina Slaughter. That's literally what your name is. And you did and, this to the state of Missouri, but it, I digress. Sorry. I, yeah, no, I mean, you're another 20 to 40 years and you'll be over that. <laughs> hey, I'll be, uh, I won't be smoldering rage over something completely out of my control for the rest of my life. I mean, I, I will say there's no one here in Maryland who remains mad about the Colts uh, <laughs> going, going to Indianapolis. I, they're, they're all, you know, gone. We'll you were legally, legally required to mention it was in the middle of the night, Denny. It, it, it was, it was. They had trucks, the trucks going in the snow. We all, we've seen the clip. Uh, real quick about the Rams. I just wanted to say, uh, uh, Jeremy Fowler reported uh, on ESPN uh, today that uh, Sean McVay, quote, looks totally comfortable with LA's reset after an aggressive five-year push. He didn't call it a rebuild. He called it a reset. And here's what uh, here's what the the general manager said. Um, I can't find it right now. But anyway, uh, oh, oh, he said uh, every year is a new year. We've had five years of great experiences. Uh, so lots of looking back and not so much looking Yikes. forward. Um, we, I, I mean, I'm thinking the Rams could be bad again. I mean, Sean McVay, I mean, as no joke, almost retired and. It seemed like he was like uncertain if he still had the fire. And I will say he's he seemed committed once he's come back, where he really shook up his coaching staff. They're really shaking up the roster again. Where he does seem like basically he decided that he was going to come back and he was going to come back like whole hog and like not phone it in. Mm -hmm. He's now contemplated retirement in back to back seasons. And yeah, he is literally my age. And uh, <laughs> maybe he should not do that just yet. Um, maybe we should go on to Kyle's. Dynasty rookie quarterback rankings. Kyle, give us just your top five rookie quarterbacks. The order probably really won't surprise anyone, but then tell us why, well, spoiler alert, you have Anthony Richardson over CJ Stroud. Yeah, I think if I were an NFL team, I probably wouldn't feel this way, but we're playing a game and we're trying to score points. And you know who scores points? Derrick Henry. And you know who looks a lot like Derrick Henry? Anthony Richardson. Like they're actually stunning. Like Anthony Richardson, I think is at the combine weighed in three pounds lighter. Uh, ran a significantly faster 40. Wow. Almost identical broad and a longer or a higher vert. Like what? he is, tr he's insane. Like I had not heard that comparison before to no. Derek Henry. That's like actually insane. Yeah. He is a absolute monster. He's the, I, I, for my money, he's easily the most athletic quarterback to ever enter the league uh, because you have to look at how big he is. He's an absolute right. beast. So, and, and the point being that whether or not he's efficient as a quarterback, I would project both in their first years and for, you know, into perpetuity that both CJ Stroud and Bryce Young are more efficient on a per pass attempt basis. I do not care when I'm playing fantasy 
I want the guy who looks like Derrick Henry with like the Blastoise cannons also strapped to his back. I'll take that and figure out, oh, he threw two interceptions this week. What am I going to do? All I have is this pile of 100 yards and two rushing touchdowns to sit on. Oh, no. So I think even in Superflex, I get that like in Superflex, you are much more rewarded both by like the market valuing these 10-year quarterbacks like Derek Carr or whatever, but I'd still rather have the guy who has QB1 overall upside. And given how today's NFL looks, it's probably unlikely that we see that like fantasy wise from Stroud or Bryce Young. I think Stroud to me is actually the best like pure thrower, incredible EPA per drop back in each of the past two years. Top five, I believe in both years, maybe six and second. Uh, Bryce Young, not far behind him. We also like Bryce Young small. Talking about, I, I get that Many, uh, uh, I can look at spreadsheets all day. Every show. Yeah, he's not huge, man. He's, I mean, what is he like? I believe he's like five, ten something. Hey, no, no joke. He, I mean, I hate people probably get tired of me making these comparisons. He is literally my size. He's right. 5'10", 190. Like, he is my size. I thought, I thought he weighed, uh, I think he weighed 204. He weighed 204, but he, let's be real. He doesn't play at 204. <laughs> yeah, he's not going to play at 204. But, you know, a lot of the short guys, I assume, or the, the light guys go to the combine and they all end up weighing more than they would play at. But the, I think the more concerning thing with his size is not that just he's small. We've seen successful small quarterbacks in the NFL, but almost universally, they're really good athletes. And even when they are good athletes, like they're still not like guaranteed success, even if they were efficient in college. Like the guys who weigh kind of close to him are like, like Michael Vick came to the NFL super light, Kyler Murray, because he's short, came to the NFL super light. Johnny Menzel was a little taller, but he's like a twig. And mm -hmm. those guys are super athletic and they didn't even all pan out. Right. So I think he's a really strong thrower of the football. I think he's like kind of comes in on the Tua trajectory, but Tua really, I don't want to say needs, but really benefits from being helped from like RPOs, play action stuff that gets like the, the defense moving behind the receivers. I don't think Bryce Young needs that level of quote assistance. Right. I, I think he can make more on his own, throw with more anticipation, but he's small. He was not as productive on like an EPA or quite as productive on like a raw stats basis as CJ Stroud. And Stroud is going to be the first overall pick. If, if, I don't want to say it's locked in, but it is very likely at this point. I'll just take the guy who the NFL views as a slightly better prospect because he's going to go 101, whose efficiency numbers are a little better. And he's 6'3", 215, if I remember correctly. He, he's prototypical NFL size. So Richardson's the best fantasy guy. You want dudes. So real quick, your rankings for fantasy Richardson. Are Richardson, Stroud, Bryce Young, Will Levis, and then Hinden Hooker. So after that, there's a chasm. I, I'm not sure we really chasm. get a starter after those guys. We might, you know, there's I, a lot I, of. I should maybe, I'm going to reveal myself as not a draft gr gr guy, grinder. I don't even know who Clayton Toon is. Uh, I do. I played him in DFS. Wow. I know. He's, nice. He's he, Houston. I know Houston, who this Houston right? guy is. That's correct. He is Houston. Yeah. 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 I had I had some Houston stacks back in the You got Stetson Bennett in here. Um, Kyle, real quick, or Denny. I'll ask Denny. Um, who would you rather have in 2023 in fan? I don't know why this conundrum would exist because this is not going to be a problem that anyone has. Mm -hmm. Who would you rather have in 2023, Kenny Pickett or Bryce Young with the Texans? Uh, uh, Bryce Young. Yeah, I, 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 I do. I think, you know, I think the, the Texans offense could be somewhat fun-ish. And uh, and I just don't see like I know I just talked to Pickett, but I I, I see <laughs> I'm hoping Bryce Young is 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 significantly better than yeah, than Kenny Pickett. Uh, Bryce I, Young I, has to oh, sorry sorry Denny you've I, I wouldn't say about Stetson Bennett he's going to start games this year yeah. I, that's I saw him he's going to start games uh, like he's, he he's was really really games. really efficient he was I mean he was like he did get better games. last year he like. He didn't like Jake from it. Like he actually did get better as his he, career. Went he's on. going to whoever drafts him. He's going to chase down that starter. The fans are going to be all about him. I know he's a hundred years old. I know there are 50 uh, metrics to say he's, he's probably not going to be good, but he has that dog. And I'm telling you, he's going to start some games. this year. He does. He's, I think the metrics would even say he's good. Like he was super, super efficient, but like he's, he's another guy who's just absolutely tiny. And he was playing with like, Five-star recruit, five-star recruit, four-star recruit, elite yeah, offensive right. line, and a really good OC as well. So, yeah, like, he, I think he'll be drafted in the sixth round. Maybe he sticks around he's, a little bit. Yeah, he's, he's, and he's reeling in Jimmy Garoppolo, and he'll be a day-two pick because the NFL, that's like yeah, – He be won't someone, be a day-two pick. I think he honestly think he's going to be a day-two pick. So there's going to be someone who convinces themselves in the dog levels. I really Please. do. 
He's not. <laughs> As our resident draft, Nick. Hopefully, I, I mean, yeah. he should not be. I, 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 there's a, there's a Stetson minute every year who goes on day two who should not go on day two. Like maybe not when usually he's quite the elderly, <laughs> but um. yeah, and usually those guys are like I think of them as almost the opposite. Is they're like the Davis Mills, right? Where like he looks like a quarterback. He's six six. It'll be really if you want that guy. It's like Tanner McKee. Every draft Nick loves Tanner McKee from Stanford, and like big, good arm. Strange that it didn't ever manifest in great efficiency numbers. <laughs> or Mike, accuracy. he was uh, literally ever good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I think that guy that you're describing is Tanner McKee. I think Stetson Bennett, one, he's just so small too. And you can kind of excuse away his production because he played for a really good team. Uh, I kind of like him, but yeah, I, I don't see it with him. Do you agree with the take that Bryce Young would be far and away the number one overall pick in this draft? If for some reason you could guarantee he would never get hurt. No. I think mm-hmm. I think he's just like that born football player type thing. Sorry to get into cliche land, but like mm-hmm. he's just like a playmaker. But I mean, I agree with the, the consensus that he shouldn't be the number one pick just because he's just too small. But like if you could like tell me like this is Madden, we're turning off injuries, I would take him in number one overall. Uh, I wouldn't have any problems well, with him number one, but like Stroud Stroud efficiency wise was better, not by a lot, right? They're both really efficient. And they're both in similar career arcs. They both sat their first year behind a future NFL quarterback and then uh, would go on to have two like really elite seasons. Um, but I, I mean, I think he'd probably be number one, but I, I don't think he would be a runaway pick at number one if you guaranteed him all, all no injuries for life. Then did you have a final thought on Bryce Young? Uh, coaches love are obsessed with Bryce Young mm-hmm. and yeah. the fact that he he like lives football. It's like Jalen Hurts. Like Jalen Hurts has like no does not exist outside of the Eagles headquarters. So no, no uh, he does not. No. <laughs> <laughs> so so they they do love. I I I I think that that will keep him afloat for quite a while, even if he struggles out of the gate. Kyle, you have Will Levis at number four and Hendon Hooker at number five. How big is the gap between Levis and Hooker? And how in the world is Hendon Hooker 25 years old? Man, anytime you can be 25 and coming off a shredded knee, uh, how yeah. big is the gap between Levis and Hendon Hooker? So I think from a dynasty dynasty perspective, it's probably reasonably large, right? It doesn't look like Hendon Hooker is going to go in the first round. It's possible every now and then a mock crops up with him there, but I think it's more likely he goes where like Jalen Hurts went in that second round. Uh, and and like you said, he was, I believe it was three years at Virginia Tech, transfers two years at Tennessee. So that's why he comes out around 25 years old. He was elite last year. I personally think He's a better prospect than Will Levis, but the NFL disagrees, and that is he was like if Anthony Richardson actually produced, kind of like he posted like he's not you know he's not a superhero, he's not like actual Superman. He just posted like insane numbers, like the kind of numbers you would expect from someone on real skill set. He's super duper efficient. Uh, He played in a really player friendly offense at Tennessee for both years. Um, So I mean. I think he his efficiency numbers, uh, he looks good on film too. Like it's easy for him. His receivers were open a lot more than other teams, but like he's incredibly accurate all parts of the field, even if maybe he has to enter the NFL and really adapt to a different scheme, like a more pro obviously style scheme. But he has zero, I, zero. He has a very slim likelihood of like accruing dynasty value in his first year because maybe he's ready for training camp, but he's not going to get the full off season uh, preparation. He has zero chance of starting in week one. He's got a, a reasonable chance of not playing at all, just like straight up red shirting for his whole rookie season. At that point, what he's like 26 and you're getting your first snap from him next year. Yeah. And I want a guy who I can, even if I, it's just like he put up some rushing stats, Will Levis goes out, doesn't have a great season, but puts up rushing stats that will probably boost his dynasty value. Cause that's what's expected. And if he just does a little more than we expect as a rusher, like he could be a really strong, like, fantasy quarterback whether or not he's efficient in the nfl we're just unlikely to get anything but a flat line from hendon hooker as a dynasty player or as a dynasty like asset in his rookie season so i think the gap is big specifically because of that i think his talents like i hope i hope hendon hooker comes back completely the way he played in tennessee i hope this doesn't mess up his knee like as a long-term issue producer adam Ooh. points out he also had a knee injury at virginia tech as a freshman and not had great it's not yeah. great <laughs> Denny, any any Hendon Hooker will have his thoughts or him? Not particularly, no. Yeah. Um, Kyle, real quick to end the show, you've got a, a tight end dynasty rankings coming up too. You're going to have receiver and running back coming as well. So we know it's like a super loaded tight end class, maybe like the best one ever. 
But is any of that going to translate to 2023 fantasy value? Can any of like this loaded group of tight ends actually be a tight end one in 2023? Yeah, the bar of tight end one, one tight end one dumb. Is that how like you know the bar like the stardom? Could you, could you... Yeah, you can make it. You can make it in. <laughs> yeah, tight end one dumb is uh, quite low. It does not take a lot to be the tight end eleven. And I think there are at least two guys who have that potential. Notre Dame's Michael Mayer, Utah's Dalton Kincaid. First and second in uh, yards per route run last year among uh, Power 5 plus Notre Dame teams. They were both strong receivers. Uh, I especially think Mayer, like, he looks like he could not leave the field at all. Like, he is a, a plus blocker, a good athlete. He's not an elite athlete, and we actually do have, like, some we, – we have technically, like, the best relative athletic score athlete ever at tight end coming into this class. But – both of these guys are probably good athletes. Don't Kincaid, we're not going to get testing on. He looks athletic when you watch him. Uh, and they're pretty good bets to go in the first round. I think Mayer is a a heavy favorite to go in the first round. Kincaid, especially after not testing him, we know tight end position where your athletics actually do have a very strong impact on your, like, both NFL, but also fantasy production, which are kind of intertwined, obviously. Not testing maybe knocks him to the top of day two, but he's going to have good draft capital. Mayer's going to have great draft capital. If either one of them land in a spot, say Cincinnati, where they could take over as a starter and garner targets, that's all it takes to be a tight end one, let alone they could immediately be more efficient than a lot of the other guys who just soak up snaps and fall into tight end one numbers, right? They are both extremely talented. So I know it's a position where transitioning to the NFL is harder than almost any other position, but they're both good enough pass catchers alone that it probably takes the right landing spot where they, they could do it. I really like Darnell Washington, but I do think he comes in and it's going to take some adjusting to get him to be a fantasy guy. He'll immediately be a beast as a blocker, but to be a guy we're excited about for fantasy, it would require either like the perfect landing spot or probably more likely time is what it'll require. Well, loaded tight end group, loaded lineup right now on NBC Sports Edge with Kyle's rookie dynasty rankings. Denny's underrated quarterbacks article is the underrated running backs article also up for 2023. Monday morning, I'm going to be dropping my annual coach rankings. Um, Joe Judge, I uh, left him off the list um, this year. He's not there. <laughs> Didn't rank Joe Judge. <clears throat> I did rank, rank Brian Dable, so look for that. Look for all of our stuff. Keep it locked on the site, even though the news has finally kind of died down to free agency. There's still stuff going on. Still a lot of coach quotes this week from the owners' meetings. So for Denny Carter, I'm Kyle Dvorak. Or <laughs> for Denny Carter, for Kyle Dvorak, I am Patrick Darty. About to go watch St. Louis Cardinals opening day. Uh, hey. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back later. Hey, it's Matthew Berry from NBC Sports and Rotoworld.com. Just want to thank you so much for watching what you just watched, or at least being too lazy to click out of it after the you know autoplay just kept it going. So either way, thank you so much for just letting it scroll by your screen. And now I'd like to ask you respectfully, 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 okay, respectfully, please subscribe to the NFL on NBC YouTube channel for the latest NFL news, fantasy headlines from Rotor World, and betting analysis from NBC Sports Edge. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.